Tell me about the project that you uh, almost innocently volunteered to work with <laughs> Ernest McCullough on. Yes, well, the, uh, the uh, physics division had a uh, experimental cobalt unit, which was used to, for a variety of purposes, and it, uh, it, one of which was, if necessary, to irradiate small animals. Um, and that's what Ernest McCullough wanted to do. He wanted to irradiate mice because he was interested in bone marrow transplantation. He and John Dart, a pedi uh, pediatrician, had in fact attempted some, I think three, uh, bone marrow transplants in children previously. Uh, they may well have been the first done in Canada. And uh, they were not successful, so he was, uh, he had directed his experimental interest toward exploring how that kind of uh, therapy might be improved. And he had done cell culture work previously, so it was a sh somewhat of a shift for him. And uh, for me, of course, it was a total shift. And uh, we began just doing some experiments on r radiation effects using different kinds of radiation uh, to see uh, if, if they, uh, we could get quantitative data on survival of mice after radiation. And uh, we, for example, we just compared x-rays and, and gamma rays, which should uh, give different results uh, because of the so-called difference, the difference in the so-called biological effectiveness uh, of these different radiations. The, and I won't, again, I won't go into details, but there should be a difference. And uh, so we did that experiment. It was basically just a kind of preliminary experiment. And it didn't turn out the way I expected. And I thought, wow, what's going on here? It, the, the mice aren't behaving the way I would have predicted. And so I looked into it carefully, and I realized that I had made a mistake in the radiation dosage, the very task I, I'd volunteered <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 to be the expert uh, in that kind of thing. So I very shamefacedly went to Ernest McCullough and I said, I've made a mistake. The, uh, the, the right dosages are such and so and such and so, because I'd done it very carefully then. And I expected that that would be, you know, sort of disruptive effect on our, our, our uh, collaboration. Well, it wasn't a collaboration yet. And it was quite the opposite. Uh, I think Ernest McCullough was first very pleased that I told him about the error to, immediately. And secondly, I think he was delighted that the physicists could make a mistake. You know, these physicists always project the image that they're... They're God, yes. Infallible, yes. So that broke the ice. And uh, in fact, it made it feasible, I think, for us to be very frank with each other in terms of discussing what experiments we wanted to do and anything else under the sun that came to our minds. And that persisted. And that was a crucial part of our, our relationship, which quickly became a collaboration where we genuinely gave, made suggestions to each other and decided together what, what way to go. An equal partnership as opposed to a senior-junior relationship. Yeah. Or a medical, non-medical uh, relationship. And um, it's famously known that you agreed to reverse your names from publication to publication. Yes, just so we would not have any fuss about that. Is that common in collaborations? Not now. It was, I think, more common, more common then, I think, uh, though I would be hard-pressed to quote any specific examples. We, we certainly didn't think we were doing anything radical by uh, adopting that policy. So what were you trying to do in your radiation experiments on mice, and how did it develop? <laughs> 
Well, the, uh, I can only say from my point of view, the, uh, uh, there was an issue at the time, ag again, about the radiation sensitivity of mammalian cells. I mean, I'd been put onto this by Hal Gray, uh, and, and who referred me to, to Ted Puck's publications uh, using HeLa cells, which are cancer cells, in culture and looking at the radiation sensitivity of those. And the, they, there was a general f a sense at the time when others had done similar radiation experiments in culture with other cells and with uh, uh, additional work that Puck had done and also some work on transplanting tumor cells into mice and looking at their radiation sensitivity, that, that there was a sort of general S sensitivity that didn't vary a lot from from cell line to cell line or from cell source to cell source for tumor cells. And uh, attempts to do that for normal cells in culture, freshly explanted fiberglass, again showed the same kind of radiation sensitivity. But from a radiotherapy point of view, it's very important to know what is the sensitivity of normal cells in intact animal or individual, because um, that's where the treatments are done, and it's the differential effect on tumor cells versus normal cells that matters the most, therapeutic ratio. So we, w we decided we wanted to try and measure quantitatively the radiation sensitivity of, of normal mouse marrow cells, uh, because we could do transplantation experiments in mice and we couldn't do them in humans. Uh, so the experiment was a little elaborate, but uh, we basically transplanted different numbers of normal marrow cells and s saw how long the animals lived and the length they lived did depend on the number of cells transplanted. And then we took normal cells and irradiated fixed number and irradiated them, so we in effect diluted them by, er, by the irradiation and saw how the animals survived after giving them those cells. And from that, we could deduce, from those comparisons, we could deduce uh, uh, radiation sensitivity for normal mouse marrow cells that were responsible for the survival of the mice. The word stem cell hadn't come into it yet. Though, of course, the stem cells that are responsible for the long-term survival of the mice. And we were able to do that and, uh, and get a quantitative result. And we published that in the journal Radiation Research in 1960. And one concern that we had about the sensitivities that we've seen, because they were a little more sensitive than the cell culture results had, show, had indicated, uh, maybe something was happening that was increasing their sensitivity, like maybe they were differentiating more or something. So we wanted to do some experiments to look at that. And that, the design involved transplanting, again, different numbers of marrow cells, normal or irradiated, and, but looking at them at different times after irradiation, not waiting for them to, to, uh, to survive or not, but looking at the fixed times after irradiation and transplantation. And uh, the, uh, particularly looking at their blood forming, organs to see whether there was something unusual going on there. And uh, the Sunday, 10 days after the transplantation and radiation happened to fall on a Sunday. And there, so Ernest McCullough came in because he was the expert at looking at, uh, at bone marrow and uh, proceeded to look at bone marrow and at the spleen of, of these mice. The spleen is a blood forming organ in the mouse, not in human. And uh, looking at spleens of these mice, and he noticed bumps, little lumps on the spleens. And he, and he, he I already knew he was an astute observer because of a past ex previous experience with, with his research, but he, he then, I mean, I remember him saying, if I see something like that, I count them. So he counted them. And uh, he, discovered that the number of bumps depended on the number of cells that had been transplanted. The more cells transplanted, the more bumps. And uh, 
I came in on the Monday, and I remember him coming, I remember him coming waving a piece of graph paper on which he'd plotted the, the number of bumps and the number of cells transplanted, and it was a nice straight line, which has some implications as so. He said, you've got to look at this. And he was obviously excited. And I th looked at it, and I got excited also. And we agreed that uh, this was pretty interesting stuff. And uh, I suggested that uh, we could do the radiation survival experiment for normal mouse bone marrow cells, quantitative experiment, much better with this approach. Look, look at the bumps. See, irradiate the transplanted cells, see what happens to the bumps. So we did that and uh, published. Actually, the results were rather similar to the ones that we had gotten previously with the much cruder assay, uh, the mouse survival. Published that in 1961 in Radiation Research, the same journal that we published previously. Um, a little digression. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, 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 I've been asked many times, why did you publish in such an obscure journal? You know, why didn't you put it in a major journal like Science or Nature? Well, I never entered my mind to submit it to Science or Nature. They, I mean, the, 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 we were doing radiation biology. That journal was the major journal for that kind of research at that time. Um, and we had published previously in the same, same journal. And I am also not convinced that either Nature or Science would have accepted it. <laughs> radiation research had a little trouble with it. Take me uh, through the argument from that first day when you've, when you've become excited about the, the bumps, I guess the colonies as you call them. Uh, take me through that to the argument of that 1961 paper. Um, well, the, the purpose of the 1961 paper was to measure the radiation, to, to report the assay, the spleen colony assay, yeah. and to use it to measure the radiation sensitivity of, of normal cells. We did not say the word, use the word stem cells in it at all, because we had no idea what cells were responsible for the formation of the lumps. Uh, but we immediately began to conjecture that they might be clones formed from single cells. And so the that the only the, we had two pieces of evidence in that paper that they might be formed from single cells. I'm talking about the 1961 paper in radiation research. One was the, the linear relationship between the number of cells transplanted and the number of bumps seen. If they, if, if multiple cells have been required to produce the lumps, we wouldn't want to expect some initial curvature before it, it started up as a straight line, as the cells sort of clumped together, if that's what they did. Now, of course, if it was individual clumps already present, then we could still get a linear relationship. The other is the radiation survival curve. I mean, I was very familiar with radiation survival curves because that was my field. And uh, the result that we got, the radiation sensitivity quantitative result that we got, was exactly what you would expect for individual cells being responsible for the formation of the colony. But that's indirect evidence. We needed more direct evidence. And at that point, we had a, a, a graduate student arrived, Andy Baker, who had a medical background. Uh, but he had, I think, been taught by Ernest McCullough, taught hematology. Anyway, he came to us, came to Ernest, and, and wanted to do a PhD program with us. And Ernest said, well, I should be the advisor because I was the academic. I mean, I was the person experienced with such programs. Ernest always felt, I think, a little, a little a bit of an outsider because he didn't have a PhD. He had an MD and, of course, postgraduate research experience, but he didn't have a PhD and had not been through that particular set of rituals. Um, so I said, yeah, sure. I was impressed with Andy and uh, suggested that he see if he could demonstrate more directly 
that these spleen colonies were formed from individual cells. And it just happened at that time that a, uh, again, a visiting speaker from England, Charles Ford, who was with a prominent group in, in England at uh, Harwell uh, Nuclear Facility, uh, a superb cytologist, uh, came to visit and speak. And we learned from him, although we could have learned from the literature if we'd known about it, that uh, ra irradiated cells, uh, well, ra radi well known that radiation produced changes in the chromosomes of cells, but what they demonstrated was that some of those chromosomal changes were compatible with the viability of the cells. In other words, they could keep multiplying and still show the chromosome changes. Uh, wow, we thought. And so Andy began seeing if he could irradiate mouse bone marrow and get colonies that would contain chromosomal changes. And the, if that could be done, it would be a beautiful way of testing the question of whether the colonies were clones because each individual radiation-induced chromosomal change is unique. You don't get the same thing. Well, it's so rare to get the same thing twice that it's va you don't have to worry about it. And uh, so he tried for quite a while to playing with the radiation dose and so on. And I was getting a little dis desperate, you know, not getting anything here. And then he got one. And that was another eureka moment. Not the same kind, but a, a moment when, oh, wow, this is now feasible as contrasted with maybe it'll never work. And so he then proceeded to demonstrate that if, uh, if there was a radiation-induced chromosomal marker in an individual colony, then all the dividing cells in that colony had the same chromosomal marker. In other words, they were clones derived from a single cell that, in which that chromosomal change marker, we called them, had been, in, had been induced. Remarkable experiment. And that led to the, I think, the 1963 paper that... That was published in Nature in 1963. Yes. Now, that, I mean, I should again digress and say, why Nature? Yes. <laughs> well, it was a nice piece of work. I mean, we all knew it was a nice piece of work. And uh, Andy wanted it submitted to Nature. I mean, the student. Uh, and so I went along, fine, you know, let's try it. And they accepted it and it, it has received a lot of attention. As you were doing that, you've talked about eureka moments and a sense of ongoing excitement. Was there a sense that you were on the key frontier in your field? Well, we, we still didn't know that we were dealing with stem cells. Uh, I mean, the, the concept of stem cells had been around for a long time. Uh, it can be traced back into the 1800s, not necessarily meaning the same thing, but the term has been used for a long time. Um, but attempts to identify them were based on electro, uh, uh, visual microscopy, primarily light microscopy and appropriate stains, which is the way a lot of histology, original histological findings were, were, were made. Uh, except that, I mean, if they, if the assumption was they existed, what did they look like? And nobody could find anything distinctive that would say, that's a stem cell. And uh, now they were a minority population, we now know in most tissues. So you wouldn't expect them to stand out. And uh, they're also, primitive cells, so you wouldn't expect them to have any particular unique characteristics, uh, at least not in visible in light, light microscopy. But uh, of course, that approach to light microscopy was important because quite early after we found this big colonies, Ernest McCullough looked at the cross sections of them uh, in the microscope. I mean, he knew how to do all that sort of thing. And uh, it's found that in, in, in many colonies, there were a mixture of 
primitive red, for, red cell uh, retroblasts, which are primitive red cells, or re cells that give rise to red cells, and primitive cells that give rise to granulocytes, or neutrophils and white blood cells. Uh, and in some, there were also megakaryocytes, which are the precursors of platelets. Now, not every colony had the, the whole mixture, but if you waited longer after, I mean, our regular time of assay had been 10 days, if you waited longer, the proportion of colonies that showed a, a, a mixture increased. So that already, if you couple that finding with the finding that colonies are formed from individual cells, then that says individual cells that form colonies can give rise to more than one kind of specialized cell. Well, that answered a question that had been around since the early 1900s. I mean, the name most attached to it is usually Maximo, uh, who postulated that the different red cell, uh, that the different kinds of blood cells all come from a common progenitor. And the, the opposition to that was, well, each one has its own separate progenitor. And we showed that in, in mice, at least, under our experimental conditions, Maxima was right. And that, then, that answered a question in hematology that had been around for quite a long time. Uh, and by, I think, about 1965, in some of your papers, what you had been calling colony-forming units, you now call stem cells. Uh, it was, in fact, a little earlier than that. Uh, the, the crucial experiments were actually initiated by Lou Seminovich. And uh, the question, I mean, his, his genetics uh, interest showed through. Do, do these spleen colonies breed true? Are there within spleen colonies cells that can themselves give rise to spleen colonies? And so that experiment w was done. And it, get, it yielded, a, again, a surprising result in that the, the number of new colony-forming units, that is, entities able to give rise to new colonies, uh, varied dramatically from one colony to another. Very heterogeneous uh, distribution. Some were able to produce a large, some colonies were able to produce a very large number of new colony-forming cells. And some, um, the majority, produced very few. But again, if we waited longer, the number that could produce at least some increased. So that provided ev strong evidence, of course, that, the, that these colony-forming units could self-renew. They could produce more colony-forming units. And at that point, we thought, uh, maybe we really are dealing with stem cells here. And because uh, we had been calling them colony-forming units, so we wouldn't prejudge. What, was, what, what it was that we were looking at. We just uh, defined them operationally by what, what we actually could see, which was colonies. And uh, we thought, well, well, will they fit the definition of stem cells? What's the definition of stem cell? Well, we looked in the literature. We couldn't find any definition of stem cells. So we, <laughs> we had to make one up, <laughs> which was that they'd be capable of self-renewal. They'd be capable of giving rise to differentiated cells, preferably more than one kind, and that they'd be able, capable of extensive proliferation. Well, the extensive proliferation is kind of built into the self-renewal uh, criterion. So those two major criteria are still used. We made them up and published that in 1963 in, a, in the another journal, uh, not Journal of Cellular Physiology, and, and used the word stem cells for the first time in that paper. Then we went on to some other things. Turning to that crucial paper uh, of yours and uh, the analysis of the um, colonies that you were observing on, on the, the spleens of the mice, do you want to give us a bit more detail about how the, uh, that uh, reasoning developed? Yes. Well, there, there, there were 
in the in the development of our work. There were really three crucial initial papers. The first one in which we reported the existence of spleen colonies and the fact they could be used for quantitative studies. Uh, the second being the, the demonstration by uh, Andrew Becker that the cells that gave rise to spleen colonies were individual cells. In other words, that the colonies were clones. Uh, the third was the work initiated by Lou Seminovich uh, looking at whether or not uh, cells that form spleen colonies were capable of self-renewal. In other words, could you find new colony forming cells within individual spleen colonies? The answer being yes, you could. So that, that combination of self-renewal and the observation by Ernest McCullough that the colonies contain more than one kind of uh, blood cell precursor led us to uh, propose a definition for a functional definition for stem cells, which has stood the test of time quite well. But they, we were still puzzled by the fact that when, what, when we looked at the individual spleen colonies for their content of new colony forming cells, the, the distribution of new colonies, new colony forming cells per colony was very heterogeneous with a few showing very many, few colonies showing very many new colony forming cells and a lot showing very few. And that distribution was not what we expected. I mean, if they were randomly distributed across the colonies, we should see a Poisson distribution, and it wasn't. So why? And I, I set that task for myself to try and find out why, and I looked at a number of statistical distributions, and some of them fit the data reasonably well, but they had no underlying justification that made any sense to me. And then one day I was browsing in the library at the physics department at the University of Toronto and came across a, a book on cosmic ray showers written by a physicist named Niels Arley. And I was browsing through this book and, and he was talking about the distribution of number of new particles in individual cosmic ray showers. And it, the distribution was very similar, very heterogeneous with a few showers containing very many partic new particles and, and a lot containing relatively few. And he had ex explained this in terms of a probabilistic model called the birth and death model, where uh, you can, the, the en entities that you're looking at can either basically self-renew and give rise to more and more, and that means a, a big shower, cosmic ratio, or uh, get lost and not self-renew, or only self-renew a few times, giving very few uh, uh, new particles in the shower. I thought that's, that makes biological sense to me in the context of, of stem cells. Suppose you have, by chance, some stem cells self-renewing a lot, you get a, large no a colony with a large number of of, of, of new stem cells in it, or if they differentiate or disintegrate, I mean, die, uh, which happens commonly in biological, in, in cell system, you get very few. And so the question was, does the, this model, get the so-called birth and death model, give rise to a distribution that resembles, a, closely resembles the one that we, we f saw experimentally? Well, it, it turned out, in my searching through the literature, the probability theory literature, that the, the, the distribution had not, it, there was no analytical solution for that distribution yet. It hadn't been solved. So the only approach to that I could think of was to do simulations, computer simulations. And at that time, uh, I had some familiarity with the so-called Monte Carlo method because a colleague of mine, Bob Bruce, had used it uh, uh, for some theoretical work that he was involved in. So I thought, well, we can do a Monte Carlo simulation and uh, see what distribution we get. So I got some help at the computer center in the physics department and uh, the distribution was constructed 
by the simulation, and by golly, it fit the experimental distribution almost perfectly. Now that's not proof, of course, that one is dealing with the, the with that model, but it's it, it leads one to 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 look further, and others did. I, we didn't. The red flag to a layman in what you've just said, Dr. Till, are the words Monte Carlo. <laughs> and uh, what could you elaborate a bit more on the Monte Carlo method? Well, it's a, it, it's a, the birth and death model is a stochastic model, which just means probabilistic. Yes. Uh, it just means you're rolling the dice. You, do, you don't know what the answer is going to be till you roll the dice. Well, uh, you can roll the dice in a computer with a computer. Uh, you can com set it up so that you, the probabilities have to be designated in advance, but not the actual outcome. And then the computer can roll the dice many times, which is where the Monte Carlo analogy comes from. I understand that there was some controversy about your work, that some of the people who tried to replicate the early experiments had problems. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, yes, the, the, my memory, my, my most uh, clear memory is of, of visiting a research group in, in uh, at Stanford and the, uh, in California, and the, uh, the radiation biologists who I knew already uh, told me that he'd been trying to reproduce the spleen colony assay and had, had failed. The mice were all dying. And uh, uh, we had uh, not had that problem. And, uh, but irradiated, um, animals are irradiated with the total, it basically is a lethal dose of total body radiation, uh, will, unless they get marrow transplant, not survive. So, and it's a question of how long. And they, I knew that the, from our own uh, experiments that uh, because we had done some work on other strains of mice, that the <laughs> you needed to have what, what I would call clean mice, they they in order to uh, to have good numbers uh, survive, and and thus have the assay be uh, feasible. So I suggested that he try some get some cleaner mice, and <laughs> which isn't easy. But there are pathogen-free colonies, for example, now, which I don't, it was harder then, it's easier now. And uh, he was able to do so. So, uh, but many others had been able to repeat our experiments. So I don't know how many couldn't. Uh, we didn't get contacted frequently about it. I just vividly remember that particular uh, anecdote.